All right. So, hello, everyone. Welcome to the CNCF End User Lounge, uh, where we explore how cloud native technologies are adopted by end user organizations across different industries and sectors. The CNCF End User Community is formed uh, with more than 155 vendor neutral companies that use open source software to deliver their product. I'm Ricardo Rocha, I'm a computing engineer in, at CERN. Uh, today, I have uh, Andy Bergen as a a uh, guest speaker. So uh, in these live streams, we bring end user members to showcase how their organization navigates the cloud native ecosystem to build and distribute their services and products. Uh, you can join us uh, every fourth Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, this is an official live stream of the CNCF, so it's subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. If you have any questions for us during the stream, we will be monitoring the chat. Uh, make sure you, you ask the questions in the live stream chat. So this week we have, as I mentioned, Andy Bergen uh, here. He will talk us uh, about um, platform evolution and five years of Kubernetes at Skypeading and gaming. Uh, before we dive into the questions, uh, Andy, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? I think I should. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the stream or watching the recording. Um, and hi to you, Ricardo. Nice to, uh, nice to be here today and thanks for inviting me on. Um, so I am lead platform engineer within the infrastructure and platform engineering squad inside the infrastructure and platforms tribe at Sky Batten and Gaming. I've been at Sky Batten and Gaming for over seven years now. I uh, originally started as a DevOps engineer um, in the Bet tribe, moved to work with Hadoop in the data tribe, and for the last three and a half years, I've been working with the Kubernetes team, which has been great. Um, before that, I did lots of things with digital marketing, um, many different hats, many different skills, um, from dev, from ops, from production management, finance, and all sorts of things. Um, but I'm really uh, enjoying being back in the tech now. Um, outside of uh, my day job, I run the local DevOps meetup in Leeds, in West Yorkshire, in the UK. And I'm also part of the organizing team around DevOps Days London, which is a conference that happens um, uh, supposedly annually, but obviously over the last year, things have been somewhat difficult around that as we uh, we all know, but we hope to be back next year. So uh, looking forward to that. Looking forward to just going to conferences in general and including KubeCon in that list right there. Awesome. That sounds pretty exciting. Lots of things. Yeah, I agree for the conferences. It's been pretty good to have an, the first one physical after all this time with North America. Yeah. But I guess we can dive into the questions. I, I would start, uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more about the infrastructure set up at your company. Um, and specifically, maybe you could uh, explain a bit what are the specific uh, technical hurdles that uh, bookmakers uh, have to face. Okay. Um, let me set the scene a little bit on that. So we are on online bookmakers. Um, we've actually been around for uh, over 20 years. Um, Initially, the uh, the betting arm of Sky Television in the UK. So we were to be the the red button on the remote. You would press that and be able to uh, place a bet. Was the idea behind that? But that was a very long time ago. And since then, obviously, things have evolved. Um, Sky Bet um, started its own technology stack um, uh, over a decade ago, and that's been growing steadily. Um, uh, we offer a range of product services around sports betting and also gaming as well. So it comes kind of poker and sports and slots um, and also all sorts of uh, other entertainment products like that. Um, I think the main thing with our industry where it perhaps differentiates from, from a lot of others is really the nature of the um, traffic patterns we get and the, and the technology stack we have to have to deal with that coupled with the regulatory stuff we have to do as well to make sure that we are looking after our customers and we are, we are compliant with the regulations. Um, and it, and it, it gives us um, a, a number of problems which we have to use technology to solve. So um, particularly to do with load, I think um, you know many people who work in retail will be familiar with the, uh, the, uh, the busy days of the, uh, uh, the Black Fridays, et cetera. Well, um, we tend to have at least one of those a week in our industry and we have to uh, 
deal with unpredictable demands. I think perhaps on the, the gaming side of things, this is a sweeping generalization. We, we know kind of the patterns and can plan around promotions for things like that. But with sports betting, um, we really are at the, uh, the whim of what happens in the sports game. So typically in the UK, the, uh, the soccer games kick off uh, at 3 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. And um, there's, there's a, a large spike in activity of people uh, placing bets up to that mark. Uh, and then what would have happened um, several years ago is that would have dropped off immediately and we would have um, really been quite quiet until the end of the day when we were settling the results. But now uh, we've got in-play markets, etc. cetera. So um, uh, we don't know quite the demand we're going to have on the services depending upon what events happen in the sports games. So, uh, you know, we've got, we've got a very spiky um, traffic pattern, which is kind of unpredictable as well. So we have to have systems which can deal with that sort of scale uh, and to be able to um, obviously make sure that uh, they're available for our customers. So they're, they're the kind of challenges we face. And I suppose to answer your questions, the traditional stack that we had in the pre-Kubernetes day, um, it would have been very much uh, VM-based, um, uh, running out of data centers and uh, building applications with enough capacity to, to deal with the load. Obviously, things are a little different now, but uh, that's kind of how things were when I started <laughs> all okay. those years ago with the business. Oh, that's super interesting, actually. The, I guess one, one of the questions I, or one of the points I'll save for later, maybe it's also understanding how you manage these spikes and maybe over provisioning of resources or I'm actually interested if you're running on premises on public cloud, but maybe maybe we can start with um, uh, your transition to Kubernetes. You just mentioned the uh, virtual machines and uh, uh, can you tell us a bit about your transition to Kubernetes and cloud native and um, how did you get that going? Okay, yeah, great, good question. So, um, yeah, I have I've set that one nicely, haven't I? So, yeah, we, we're, uh, we're, we're about to start on a Kubernetes journey and this is, this is back in 2016. And it wasn't meant to be a Kubernetes journey. It was going to be a journey of what could provide the next generation of hosting platform for the back tribe. Um, and, and, you know, what, what platform could we put together that um, really made it easier for developers? I think um, as kind of like um, operations engineers, I think we maybe approach problems from thinking about um, the problems it can solve for us. But really, um, this this whole journey started on about how do we get our developers to go quick? Um, we're in a very fast changing market. A lot of um, uh, companies um, in competition with us. How can we get products to customers? How can we make it easy for our developers? Because unless codes in front of our users, it is it's kind of worthless. So how can we make that easy? And how can we address some of the um, problems that we were having with the more kind of traditional infrastructure we had? Uh, you know, the quality gates, the bottlenecks, how can we enable those, but still do it in a safe way? So the objective really was around creating a platform which had as few human interactions between somebody pushing code to a repo and having an automated process to get that onto the servers in front of people. That, that was the objective. Um, and to do that, um, we, we, we set about building out some... Um, some pox first of all obviously you've got a technology choice and back in 2016 um kubernetes was still relatively new um wasn't as mature as some of the other uh, container stacks that were around then so there was some technical evaluation done with that uh also at the time this was one of the first pieces of work which wanted to run in public cloud as well so uh, although traditionally a lot of our stuff would run in data centers we did have some stuff in cloud uh, but we wanted to get more stuff in there so we did the initial kind of um, proof of concepts to check out the technologies, settled on Kubernetes, I'm very pleased to say. It was before my time in the team, but I'm glad they chose it. Um, but uh, after that, it became a, how do we build with the developers a platform that they need? So we worked with the team that has one of these spiky workloads I referred to earlier. So what we call our push team. So they are the... Uh, the updates in a, in a, in a typical um, uh, sports website, there are lots of events happening, not just like football games, but things that happen in football games or netball or what, whatever it is. And these events can change the prices of markets that people can gamble on. So there's, there's literally thousands of updates a minute going through that all need to be reflected 
uh, on the user's device, what they, which they're using to interact with us. So we worked with the uh, the push team to build out an MVP first of all, building it out using uh, Container Linux as it was at the time uh, on AWS, um, provisioning sort of the uh, uh, cloud storage and cloud load balancers as we needed for that. And what that allowed us to do was on a platform that um, for, for, for the uh, for the updates that when there weren't many updates, we could scale it right down, and when it was busy, we could scale it up. Um, and that platform was very successful, and it went on to become the Kubernetes platform, which was fairly widely adopted around the business. And uh, here we are now, um, five years later, with a whole bunch of people around the business from different departments using it. Super interesting. I, I think that the, the early adopters went through the same process as well of uh, like deciding which orchestrator uh, and container platform they should choose. That's also very nice to hear. Um, that maybe maybe you can dig also, you, you just mentioned that you deploy on AWS. Um, maybe you can mention a bit about the stack. Do you use like managed Kubernetes or, or is it like uh, your own um, deployment? And which yeah, sure, sure. So obviously we're talking 2016 and I think GKE was available back then, but in, a, uh, um, in its very early days too. Um, so we decided to uh, do things the hard way as was the, uh, the the way to do things back there. So um, we we didn't we didn't do things completely the hard way. We based I think I mentioned before we use Container Linux, so Core OS um, as the base for our solution, and we provision that through uh, a bunch of Terraform, which would provision in our case EC2 instances, uh, which ran Core OS. We took a slightly um, novel approach, which has worked really well in the sense that we wanted the whole thing to be ephemeral. So effectively, when we reboot or create nodes in our cluster, um, they pixie boot into core OS, work with some um, container Linux technologies called Matchbox and Ignition to pull down pre-rendered configuration mm -hmm. uh, for, those, uh, for those nodes, and then effectively boot from scratch. They go into the early user space where they um, take these uh, the Matchbox and the Ignition configuration and they, uh, they, they apply that to the OS and before it goes into proper user space. So it's kind of like a, a pre-boot thing inside Container Linux. So we use that to provision and set up the node with all its specific um, settings and configurations, mainly, mainly system D files. And then we boot properly and that's when the operations operating system spins up. So that means that if we reboot a node, we kind of start from scratch. We do have some persistent storage on there, which are volumes mounted off the file shares to store things like Docker images because that connects as a cache. We don't want to pull down all the containers every time we start them up. Uh, but other than that, a lot of stuff is held in uh, memory disk. Um, so slightly different setup to some other um, some other clusters. But that, that's where it really went. It means things like upgrades are uh, a change of a version number in a repo, and then we republish all the uh, matchbox and ignition stuff through uh, Terraform, and that means that when the node reboot, they can pull in a new image of Core OS. So that that works really well. Um, we run the control plane in high availability. We run that across a couple of nodes. The etcd database is backed up very regularly, and yes, we have tested it to make sure we can restore it as well. Um, like I say, we use a lot of Terraform to actually do the provisioning and based on um, other system components we should expect like a monitoring stack based on prometheus uh, we use some of the other services which were already running and uh, supplied for developers around the business so we don't run our own logging stack that goes into our elastic stack that's run by one of our uh, other teams in the business so we kept that familiar um, stack of uh, tooling mm -hmm. which the developers knew um, and now we don't just run aws we also run on-prem using uh, the same Terraform and um, uh, Ignition scripts, although they are slightly customized for different provisioners for things like storage and for uh, and, and for the virtual machines as well. So uh, we run those on, uh, on VMware. But it's essentially the same configuration, regardless of which environment you're running in, apart from the nuances of, the, uh, uh, of storage and load balancers and uh, et cetera. But essentially, we keep the same stuff. And... Um, yeah, that's allowed us to uh, keep parity between all the environments. And we run about five clusters. Uh, we don't run a lot of clusters, and we run them independently as well. We don't have like a, uh, a, 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 a cluster mesh over the top of that, although we do run the service mesh. It's the OBA we run that locally. Yeah, 
on each cluster. All right, super nice. Uh, like one question I have is just before we jump into the Kubernetes details, you have a bunch of small socks behind you. <laughs> so um, yes, on the wall behind me, um, this is a, we, we recently moved offices um, during the pandemic. So um, we, uh, we, 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 we uh, I left the office in uh, March 2019, uh, and I've only been back once to, to collect stuff because we moved offices. So we're now in a, uh, a a building that's entirely owned by the company, which is, which is really nice and it's completely custom set up. Um, but in the office, we had um, a few bits of um, uh, kind of. Uh, Customized stuff we had around the place just to make the place feel like home. So the Kubernetes sign behind, which says platform engineering, that used to hang above our desks. Uh, and basically when I went in to collect my stuff, I stole it. Um, I don't think work know that, so I probably shouldn't have said that out loud. Uh, but the socks behind me are uh, from Conference Swag. Many of those pairs will have been from a KubeCon or two. Um, and at the time we were going through our socks audit. Um, so there's kind of a pun there. So we, uh, we, we uh, used to uh, have those in the office with a graph of the number of socks we had and the number of socks we were going to tell the audit auditors was kind of a joke. So yeah, that was our that was our official socks audit for the Kubernetes platform. Beautiful, cool. <laughs> I'll go back to the. Not big geeky mechanic. That's pretty good. All right, so um, I guess like digging a bit more into the Kubernetes part, um, like you mentioned, you started um, and eventually you you had to um, manage, I guess, growth as things uh, picked up. So um, I guess I had two questions here. One is just uh, the growth of extended usage once things get popular. The other one is kind of related to what you mentioned at the beginning to, for handling spikes. Do you have some sort of auto scaling and how do you manage that? Uh, yeah, maybe? sure. So so yeah, um, yeah, the growth of the cluster. So um, yeah, we, we, we started off with, as I said, we, we, we built it for one customer and one use. Um, and that gained popularity really, really quickly. Um, and um, with that comes some challenges because you've not only got to scale tech, uh, you've got to scale people, you've got to scale um, the way you work as well. Um, so um, I think when we, when we moved to on-prem, well, there were some changes we had to make around the code base. So we made some optimizations at that point to, to handle some of the uh, some of the growing pains we'd seen in the first iteration of the cluster. So we, uh, for example, on in AWS, we could use the cluster auto scaler to deal with workloads. So as things got busy, uh, we could pop up more EC2 instances to run uh, more workloads on. And obviously, as it got quiet, we could scale that down as well. Um, so that was great on um, on AWS, but on prem. That's not something we can do. We have to kind of over provision for on prem. Um, the bits we had to swap out were, I think we mentioned it just before, we tend to like storage provisioners. So if you want a slice of storage on the AWS based clusters, you get an EBS volume. If you're um, on prem, you get a slice of NetApp provisioned through, uh, through our uh, in house storage arrays. Uh, load balances, you get an LB in AWS. If you're on prem, you get a slice of F5 configured. And of course, what we wanted to make sure we did with that was we kept the same developer experience. So although the uh, the, the um, provisioners for for cloud were fairly well you know understood, we had to write some custom stuff to do that on prem. But we didn't want developers to be slowed down by having to configure F5s and to be requesting storage. So we used the same. Um, uh, obviously, we kept the uh, the uh, system volume. Uh, storage, we just changed the provisioner there, which um, makes it sound really simple. There was a lot of work went into that. And the same with uh, load balancer provisioning. Um, obviously, we didn't necessarily want our developers to be logging into F5s and configuring those when they could just declare the state of what they wanted their network connections to be, and the, the cluster should do that for them. And, and obviously, we, we put that together as well. So, um, yeah, they were, they, they were some of the... Um, challenges we face from keeping that parity as we changed environments. Um, in terms of growing, um, we, uh, I think when we were working more closely with certain teams, we hadn't necessarily anticipated the challenges ahead with that, particularly multi-tenancy. And I mean, I think the, the initial year of the cluster was without RBAC because it wasn't there. Um, I know RBAC was added shortly before 
uh, I arrived to the cluster. But that, that presented some challenges because um, how do we manage that for both environments? Uh, we've got a solution based off Vault and uh, LDAP groups, which allows teams to authenticate and get access to um, to the cluster. So from that, they're restricted to what namespace they can do. We've done a lot of work with putting insane defaults and least privileged security when those namespaces are created. So that if you get on the cluster, you're kind of locked down to start with until you unlock the bits you need. So you have to set up your network policies, you need to set up quotas and stuff. Um, and by that, we've kind of managed the expectations of the customers getting on. Um, we've got a support channel where people can raise support requests and tickets and uh, ask questions and we can help them there. Uh, but I think the, the main thing we, we found was, in terms of that growth, was our users didn't always understand the line between what was the Kubernetes thing and what was our Kubernetes thing. And the, there's an expectation from ourselves there that we, um, expected our development teams to learn how to build apps for Kubernetes and also how to maintain and manage those. Um, and off the back of that, we've, um, you know, we've put in a lot of training. Uh, we've trained over 400 developers on a couple of different courses on how to build and write apps for Kubernetes so that they can get that right. Uh, but of course, there's still, you know, um, I've heard it said that Kubernetes isn't a developer tool. I'm not sure whether I agree with that definition, but um, I think that there's definitely a barrier to entry there, but um, whether or not it's it's massive or uh, small, I think largely depends on the developers we're working with. As an example, we've we've got developers who would gladly be given root access on everything and would uh, uh, love to uh, uh, insert records directly into the etcd database, given the opportunity to do so in the control plane. But obviously. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got people that just want to put a few lines of YAML together and they're not that interested in, in what that is because they've got, you know, quite rightly, developers have got a, a whole lot of other stuff to deal with. Um, you know, domain uh, knowledge of their actual problems they're trying to solve, the code they're trying to write, uh, the business logic. You know, there's the, you know, I think the uh, expectation that go away and learn Kubernetes as a, like an afterthought, I think, is something that that doesn't really work. Um, and I think we, we got bit a little bit by that, and hence we've had to retrospectively do um, quite a bit of training around that to uh, to bring, um, well, to, to help developers uh, easily understand what they need to do on our clusters and how our clusters work. All right, now that, that's very interesting. Maybe, maybe I, I have maybe another question uh, about the management of the clusters, but maybe building on the developer experience that you were talking about, uh, is, is there like a streamlined or recommended way for people to manage and deploy their applications? You, you mentioned that they, they have access to the clusters, but but is there like a recommended way to manage the lifecycle of their deployments or, or the upgrades? Do, do you, like there, there's all this talk about GitOps to embrace this kind of thing or use some other tooling? Uh, maybe you can explain yeah, it. It's it, it, it I, th I think um, given a time machine, we would have put more developer tooling in place or encourage the teams that we work with initially to do that. Um, I think um, if we were starting again from scratch now, we would we'd certainly have some opinionated ways of building mm -hmm. apps for Kubernetes and what we've supported on there. But um, as with all ecosystems that evolve, um, we now have the, uh, particularly the Bet tribe. I put together a standard way of building applications. So after a couple of years of people going off and doing their own thing or uh, being influenced by what other teams have done, um, there's now a pattern evolved of how things should be done. And we have a team that are, uh, are building, um, uh, a built, sorry, an application helm chart, which allows developers to build applications based off a set of base images, which are regularly updated. They can, um, uh, take their applications, there's pipelines built for those to deploy those onto the clusters. There's, they get a set of standard dashboards and they get a, uh, uh, a bunch of tooling uh, and um, uh, references to where they can find the logs, et cetera, all of that kind of thing, which are, you know you need to, to run an application. But that uh, wasn't built by us, that was built by another team. And that's kind of becoming slowly the de facto way. And we're seeing lots of our developers migrate to, to that way of doing stuff, which is nice to see. Um, I think, as I say, if we could start again, we would um, perhaps have done things a little differently. And I think 
Well, one of one of the things we we've done over the last three years, and certainly for, for my day job as well, is we relied heavily on this kind of um, um, use of developer experience to kind of like solve a lot of the growing pains we, we had with the cluster. Uh, we got a lot of users on there uh, fairly quickly. And I think we suffered the growing pains sort of internally of how we were working with the clusters. So we've done it. We've done a heck of a lot over the last three years to, to like, to like smooth that out. Um, starting with just basically talking to more and more of our users about what they want from the cluster, how they're going to use it. Um, understanding who was actually using our cluster was was quite a big uh, a big undertaking. We did trying to understand um, which workloads belong to teams because they can move around as well. So we, we basically tag all the workloads on the clusters now with metadata. So there's labels which indicate who owns the stuff. Uh, and that's, that's allowed us to do a load of really cool stuff. It's allowed us to shard the logging. So rather than just having one logging pipeline, well, we can do that per tribe now. There's a lot of work gone into that. Um, I mentioned we go out and we, we speak to teams. We, we talk about requirements. We take that feedback back. We can do that and understand about the workloads which they're running. But it's enabled other stuff away around um, well, this was well around things like best practice and standards. So we put together a whole bunch of um, ideas and call them best practice, call them standards, the principles of how you build and run an application at Sky Betting and Gaming on a containerized platform. So we've got standards around build, run, deploy now. Um, and we've got that, that was built with input from everybody um, who was using our cluster. So we've got like a collective uh, mindset on that. It's not just our opinionated uh, version of, uh, of what looks good. Um, so we've got that. Uh, and then we built tooling around that to kind of like check on that as well and provide dashboards, etc., to indicate where things aren't following the rules and some possible solutions they could have to uh, to fix that. So um, we've we, done a lot of work on that. And it's, um, you know, that's evolved further into things like um, understanding costs and education on resources and things like that so that we can um you know run things efficiently as well yeah yeah i think like you you covered a lot of the challenges uh yeah it sounds sounds very good but one one thing like it, it, maybe you already mentioned but if you would say like the main problem you would have today while running your clusters well would you highlight something you, you mentioned a bunch of stuff that that, that is uh, tricky to handle and uh, that yeah. Is kind of a challenge. Well, I, I think from the technical side, you, you're always going to have, um, you know, and this is, this is a Kubernetes problem. This is just a, a, you know, a running computer systems problem, running distributed systems. Uh, you know, you've got, you're going to have face problems with problem workloads and with components of the system not behaving. There's, you know, constantly keeping things up to date, keeping things evergreen, a management of that. Um, and then, of course, the, the probably the big one, which um, I think um, whichever system you're running uh, is going to be capacity, uh, particularly in an on-prem environment. You know, do you have enough storage? Do you have enough network bandwidth? Um, is your monitoring able to scale with your workloads? Um, and then coming down to like right-sizing workloads to uh, to have the right requests and limits on them, trying to support teams to 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 get that right. We, we find that particularly challenging because I don't think there's a great range of tooling out there to, to, to help with that. We've built some in-house tools. We're building more. We know this is a problem and we're, you know, in order to get our development teams to understand and to set their requests and limits correctly, we need to help them to do that. We can't just, you know, uh, you know, produce graphs and, and point out inefficiencies or, you know, things getting in killed or, uh, CPU throttled, etc. That's not going to help. So we we need to put better tooling around that. So that that there's some of the day to day challenges, but many of them are, you know, just keeping things up to date, making sure we're maintaining uptime, keeping things reliable. So, yeah. yeah, sounds very good. Very good. Uh, I'm just checking if there's a question. I don't see any. So. Um, Maybe maybe we can switch slightly the topic and less from the um, the technical or tooling uh, part, but maybe you can tell us how what's your experience uh, as an end user in this community? Uh, is there I don't know what's your feeling uh, interaction with other end users or with the tools and uh, the well. Um... 
You mentioned so, uh, you've been to a couple of cons from from the Sox as well, so I guess uh, <laughs> you've been involved. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I mean, uh, I, I think from the, the the end user community, I mean, um, being a member of that, um, it, it really um, that, that's a real boon when when you're at the conference. I think um, um, the attending UCon is. Um, Something the team have really enjoyed. I've not actually been to one yet. I've got to be honest about that. So, uh, but I am hoping to get there. But I do like the physical conference. I've been to the virtual ones, uh, but I, I I love the whole hallway tracks, etc. Uh, but there again, I am a conference organizer, so I uh, I'm a little bit of <laughs> opinionated on that. Um, but yeah, I know KubeCon is certainly something which the team have have, uh, have been to and have come back full of ideas, full of. Um, different approaches to doing stuff i think i think the, the the main takeaway i take from the team when they've been and they come back is they say they had a plan of what they were going to see and obviously as you'll know cube is a massive conference with, with with many many tracks there of talks to see um and they always come back waxing lyrically about the things they didn't expect and uh, i think when where i think almost they, they've said when they went to like the popular talks and they couldn't get in actually the ones they went to because it was near or, um, or or it looked interesting. They're the ones where they picked up these little tidbits and these little interesting uh, bits of knowledge which have come back and have been used. I think um, like OPA was, was 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 a great example of that. No one had heard of it before. Uh, I can't remember if they went to I think it was Copenhagen. I think that was the one they went to before they went to Barcelona. Uh, and they came back from that like like this is brilliant. We have to use OPA. It's it's obviously like 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 the you know something we can we can um use to help our teams on the cluster you know but without actually ending up with that talk they would have obviously we would have known about it eventually because obviously it's like a huge topic now but i don't think we'd have had that um kind of early visibility of it i think um a lot of our early istio adoption was based around um talks and examples and demos and talking to other people at kubecon which is which we've seen so yeah, um, but I think even more than just the conference, which of course is you know great and important. I think um, I think supporting the CNCF is important because um, you know we we rely heavily on um, the projects which it, it, it looks after. So supporting that is super important to us. Um, so yeah, I think the uh, you know the the end user community is is really important, and so is Cubecom. That's brilliant, and uh, yeah, we're all hoping that uh, normality will come back uh, next oh, yes. year. Probably. Fingers crossed. It it looks like it's it's happening. Um, so you you actually mentioned uh, um, a lot of a lot of the tools that you you are relying on. You, you mentioned, of course, Kubernetes. You mentioned Prometheus. You mentioned Helm, OP, OPA just now. I'm, I'm kind of curious because you have a pretty large uh, deployment. And, and interestingly, you have both on-premises and public cloud deployments. So it's multi-cluster. Uh, you mentioned that you don't do any kind of uh, um, communication between the clusters, which is also kind of common, I, I think, from, from what I hear. Uh, are there any tools? You also mentioned challenges in costs and things like this. Are there any tools um, or, or technologies that you're particularly interested on um, integrating in the near future or that you're looking forward to to look at? Yeah, I mean, we're, uh, I mean, there, there are a couple I can mention. So, for example, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're heavy on our Prometheus adoption and we have had constant requests for uh, long term storage and metrics. Um, so Victoria metrics is something we're we're heavily looking into now. Obviously, we want to manage that carefully because um, we're aware that um, uh, long term storage, you know, uh, means different things to different users, and uh, we, we're particularly careful on how we uh, manage our Prometheus instances as it is based on you know things things like the amount of um, cardinality the metrics have and startup times etc. So. Um, you know, uh, Victoria Metrics is something where uh, we, we've rolled out and we're starting to roll out to our customers now so that there's long-term storage, but we want to do that in a manageable way. So that's, that's one of the things we're, we're doing. Um, we've used uh, Gatekeeper, which is a tool which allows you to basically report on OPA 
um, states. We've used that for our kind of like standards and best practice dashboard. We wrote a, an exporter, which takes that data out in the format we want, because we've obviously got a lot of um, metadata tagging in there, which can identify workload ownership and stuff. So then in the dashboards, we can visualize that by ownership as well. So, so that's been a very useful technology. Um, there are various updates to the networking stack going on, um, updates to Istio at the minute. Um, the 122 upgrade is um, not without its challenges, I don't think. Um, so we are working closely with our users. Uh, and I suppose that the great thing about already having those community, uh, those um, communication channels with our users in place has actually made that fairly straightforward. We're able to identify workloads and go and talk to them. They're going to have problems when we do the upgrade. So um, uh, we're hoping to have everything in place in the next couple of weeks so we can go to 122. But I, I suppose the overall thing with our cluster is although we're looking at different, um, new, we're always looking at new bits of technology and replacing existing functionality with, with newer bits. Um, I think the thing we, we, we're more fan, fans about is just stability and updates to things. You know, we've got a lot of operators that we run. Um, you know, we want them to be stable. We want the underlying Kubernetes system to be stable. We want the monitoring stack to be stable. We want all the things that send data from the cluster to all of the other um, services which ingest our stuff to be stable. You know, st stability is a big thing. And, um, you know, uh, it's a dull answer. Uh, and it's not a very exciting one because it's not like the, the, you know, the new shiny tech. But, but we kind of like things just just working I think one of the things we're really um pleased about with our cluster is is the stability of it and, and we like to keep it like that and nobody likes getting paged and we, we want to we want, we want to keep it like that as best we can no, i think that's that's pretty fair and yeah i think that the, the interesting bit here is also that um, you have a pretty uh, like large uh, deployment, and it, it's interesting to see how you scale things like Prometheus or Metrics and things like this. And you're looking at these new new products to to handle that. I think for other end users, is it's extremely useful this feedback. So I think uh, I don't think we have any questions. Uh, one one thing maybe I would uh, put here is: uh, uh, Do you have something else that uh, you would like to? tell other end users or the community that we didn't cover here? Uh, yeah, I mean, one, one thing I haven't really covered, um, which has been uh, really important to, to, to the team, is how we use Kubernetes not just to, to run workloads. We also use it to provision infrastructure. Now, obviously, I mentioned things like load balancer provisioning. I mentioned like storage right. provisioning, but they're kind of, um, um, you know, they're with the basic built-in primitives for, for Kubernetes. So, if you, you know, you want a PV, mm -hmm. you will get some storage. If you if you want a load balance, and I mentioned that that's configured for you. Um, based on that work, though, the 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 automation really hasn't stopped there. So, um, I will give you some examples. We were a team that, that that did the F5 automation. They're now trying to automate more things. So, if you want more, if you want to configure an F5 now for a virtual machine usage. Um, you can do that through um, through a code base where you um, uh, where you um, uh, commit um, YAML definitions for the load balances you require. So even if they're outside of Kubernetes, we can use our provisioner inside of the cluster to actually configure load balances for things that aren't in the cluster. So uh, obviously, there's a pull request approval on that, but it means that rather than going into an F5 and configuring configuring that for teams, it's now all done as code. That is obviously you know a massive uh, benefit. The same with DNS entries. We've done a lot of automation uh, in the cluster, and if you want a DNS entry, you can create a DNS object in the cluster that's got an operator behind it, which will provision you a DNS entry in our DNS provider through the through their API, and we'll handle all that and we'll tear it down when you don't want it, etc. But equally, we've got another repo where people can put those DNS definitions, and they'll just get created even if the DNS record isn't used by something inside the cluster. So we're starting to automate bits of infrastructure through Kubernetes, even if it isn't Kubernetes. So uh, two more examples uh, of that. Um, uh, firewall automation has been something we've been, you know, every organization is wanting, you know, that software defined networking is, is something that the organizations have want. Obviously we have, you know, over a decade's worth of network 
configuration in data centers, in offices, et cetera. We're now starting to build tooling which will configure uh, some of the firewalls through things um, that are provisioned from Kubernetes. So again, we've got a repo where these rules can be defined and they can be pushed out to Kube and they can be configured through the tooling that's available within Kubernetes. Um, another example of that is uh, Cert Manager, which I'm sure people are very familiar with. Um, we're using that with our certificate provisions now to manage certificates, and we're hoping to offer that outside of the cluster. So there's lots of bits of automation right. that we run inside Kubernetes to um, to manage the resources we need, or uh, you know, teams or developers need, and indeed people with infrastructure. But we can also offer that as the way to manage this stuff in an automated way outside of the cluster. So that, right. that, that I think is something we, we, we you know, we, we're building on and building on. And I think uh, a lot of the automation we're going to be doing over the uh, um, next 18 months for um, things for infrastructure are going to be powered by Kubernetes as well, even though they may never have a workload related to it in the cluster. I think that, that that's, that's a trend that has been going maybe in the last two CoCons, maybe we see a lot of uh, projects like Crossplane that seem to be like starting to look at managing things that are not related to containers or containerization at all. They are just relying on Kubernetes as a platform, I guess, for, for all of this. So it seems that you've been, you, you've gone pretty far already. Yeah. I mean, and of course, it, we, we're also doing that for things in the cluster as well. So, you know, operators are you know, th things like, um, you know, uh, we've got an in-house uh, MySQL provisioner, which will, you know, with a small chunk of YAML, create in your namespace a, you know, however many um, node or container-based replicated MySQL cluster you want. And with the, the amount of resource and tooling to back it up and restore it built into that operator. So we've done a lot of work on that kind of thing. We do offer some operators which we didn't write. So obviously the Prometheus operator is one which we use a, a lot to manage the Prometheus instances on the cluster. But we got stuff for Redis and a few other bits and pieces as well. Um, so that means that, you know, obviously like like developers, they don't have to go and, uh, you know, ask for that or provision it or, you know, um, or, or manage it themselves. You know, you want a MySQL, it's about six lines of YAML. Yeah, that's brilliant. I, I actually, we, we still have a couple of minutes, so I just uh, thought of something also because you, you are mentioning uh, managing things that are not in the cluster. You also mentioned that you have like multiple clusters, uh, multi-tenant. Um, just out of curiosity, how do you handle this um, setting of external resources when you have multiple clusters? Are users uh, like allocated to a, a certain cluster or do they see these resources everywhere? Or yeah, so 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 I think the the, um, the LDAP groups are obviously shared in the organisation. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're the, the LDAP groups you're in, and they obviously define which set of permissions you get, and then the, those are bound to access on the various um, certain amount of points within within Vault. So we use Vault on a per environment basis. We don't have a, a, I don't think we have a Vault in every environment, but I think. Um, the environment configurations are set within the same vault instance. So they're, they're not shared, but they may be managed on the same one. All right. Very interesting. I think I think uh, this has been fascinating. Thanks so much for, for all the information. Uh, I think we will wrap up here. And um, right. I guess um, if, if there are any follow-ups? Uh, people can reach out uh, either either finding you or or, or meeting yeah. you. At, um, I, I'm on the LinkedIn. I'm I'm fine. I'm findable on there. I'm Andy Bergen on Twitter. If you want to tweet me, please. Yeah. Do. Or hopefully, like, share some drinks or on a future CoopCon. I will look um, forward to that. Uh, that that, <laughs> that would be great. I'm I, like I say. I I I organize. I, I I spent eight years organizing meetups. And a, and a few years organizing uh, conferences, and I, and I haven't done any of that for, for for getting on for two years now, and I miss it. And I'm looking forward to getting back to doing that, and uh, yeah, talking to people about stuff and uh, finding out what they're up to. So that'd be great. Okay, okay, super cool. So then, thanks everyone for joining the this episode of the Cloud Native End User Lounge. Uh, it was great to have uh, Andy talking about uh, sky betting and gaming and how to use uh, Kubernetes and Cloud Native. Um, 
Uh, again, I remind that uh, the end user uh, stories are uh, happening every fourth Thursday of the month at 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, don't also forget, as we mentioned a couple of times already, to join us at KubeCon, Cloud Native Com EU. Uh, it's May 17 to 20, and we'll have a lot of latest uh, information from the Cloud Native community. Um, also, if you would like to showcase your usage of Cloud Native tools as an end user, then you're welcome to join the end user community with more details at cn cncf.io slash end user. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. See you next time. And thanks a lot, Andy, for the great. Uh, you're welcome. Great Thank, thanks for having me. It's been, uh, it's been it's been good fun. Nice to share with uh, with people what we've been up to. So uh, yeah, it's been great. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye.